in think tank land and academia uh, and policy research world always love to talk about lessons learned. Mm -hmm. We probably should talk a little bit more about lessons forgotten. Thank you, Nick, for being here. You hold the Henry Wendt Chair in Political Economy at the American Enterprise Institute, and thank you for doing the chapter for the American Family Diaries volume. You start off the chapter by saying modern America is beset by a crisis of male non-work. That is, these are people who are not just unemployed, they're actively not looking for work, and they've dropped out of the labor force. Could you talk a little bit about sure. your interest in that and why, sure. why you wrote about this? Um, I, uh, I started writing about the problem of men without work back in 2016 mm -hmm. when I sort of stumbled across it. I mean, I'm not a labor economist, nor have I ever been a labor economist, <laughs> but I saw this big problem in the U.S. labor market. Um, our unemployment statistics mm -hmm. measure the total number of people who do not have work and are looking, looking for work. For work yeah. But there is now a much larger phenomenon. The number of people who are neither working nor looking for work, mm -hmm. especially in arguably prime working ages, like right. the 25 to 54 group. And if we look at the most recent monthly job report from mm -hmm. the BLS at the time that we're right. talking together, yeah. um, the work rate, the employment to population ratio for uh, civilian non-institutional American men 25 to 54 mm -hmm. is almost as high as it was in 1939. It's almost, it's almost up to yeah. that, which is to say we still have a depression scale problem mm -hmm. of non-work for U.S. men as of 2019-2020. That's, that's interesting and, and sort of appalling, <laughs> sort of right? Appalling. I mean, what is, what is going on? So, you, so you, you sort of say, well, there are a few blind spots in the U.S. statistical system. We don't capture a lot of data that we need to understand this phenomena. Uh, and this has uh, sort of given rise to this idea that there, maybe there isn't work available for these you know, 7.1 million men sure. that you identify. Sure. But, but we know, and as you point out correctly in the chapter, we do have you know, over 7 million vacancies in the U.S. So it's not as if the jobs don't exist. So what kind of sort of data uh, you know, isn't available? What aren't we asking? What's going on with the statistics? Well, I mean, as you appreciate, uh, mm -hmm. Aparna, when... Uh, when the current population survey asks questions, it has to limit the yeah. number of questions that it's <laughs> asking. Or else the respondents are going to go screaming out of the room and you know, <laughs> tearing their hair. So uh, the, uh, the, uh, the CPS only offers less than a dozen options to mm -hmm. respondents for explaining why, why? they are not yeah. working. And that's a uh, a pretty kind of Procrustean bed to mm -hmm. force people on to, to try right. to answer this. The, there are millions and millions of human stories mm -hmm. in this troubling situation we have in the U.S. today, and we need to get some texture to it. We mm -hmm. need to get some nuance to it. Uh, we need to get the human dimension to it, and I'm sure that is what informed your entire Absolutely. research project yeah. on wanting to follow what we're calling here ethnographic research. That's exactly right. I mean, some of the thinking behind uh, this work is to sort of get at those stories. And as you say, you know, there's 7 million stories about why people are not in the workforce. And the CPS will give you, what, 12 options yeah. to figure out, you know, nice. which of these slots do I fit into. And the role of ethnographic research, at least from my perspective, would be to say, okay, go to these men or go to these families and say, well, what is it, you know, that's holding you back from, from working? Um, so, um, what do, you, what do you think, you know, what role can ethnographic research play? Do you think that there's a role, there's, there are limitations of that type of research as well, I'm sure, but, you know, where do you see the storytelling, what, where does the storytelling fit in? Well, uh, of course, you've chosen um, the framework of ethnography for right. this. And, uh, I mean, there is a, a scholarly tradition mm -hmm. to ethnography. Um, to my way of uh, looking, it's 
wonderful mm -hmm. to have a sympathetic, empathetic, interested right. observer mm -hmm. interacting with people that we're concerned about. Right. And I mean, I can see us maybe calling this uh, uh, good journalism. Yeah. I can see <laughs> us maybe calling it anthropology. Yeah. Uh, there are different sorts of traditions mm -hmm. that uh, might be valuable here. In the case of uh, J.D. Vance, a yeah. few years ago, it was just I autobiography. Yeah. But he was a, uh, again, he was a, uh, a loving but honest mm -hmm. uh, observer of what had, what had occurred in him, yeah. his own chaotic <laughs> uh, right. family and community. Yeah. So it's, it's first and foremost, I would say, getting the uh, set of eyes mm -hmm. uh, to uh, show us what people like me and people like you can't mm -hmm. see when we're looking at decimal yeah. points and yeah. big rows of the numbers. numbers and it's, <laughs> it's, the hum, it's the human quality. It's the human now, uh, I, I have no doubt that there's a great deal of uh, training that can go into this, but there's also a certain, I would surmise, a certain inescapable art mm -hmm. that if you don't have the spark yeah. for doing this sort of work. Yeah. There is no number of semesters that you can be imprisoned <laughs> in school to, to get the routine. That's so right. so th it's a combination of uh, preparing people but also of having the gift for, it, just, just the same way for that some people have the trying to get the, the stories gift. out. Yeah. That's exactly right. You make an important distinction in the chapter between poverty and misery. What is that all about? Sure. Well, we uh, in think tank land <laughs> and academia uh, and policy research world always love to talk about lessons learned. Mm -hmm. We probably should talk a little bit more about lessons forgotten because there are a lot of lessons forgotten. Mm -hmm. And the distinction between poverty and misery uh, certainly is one that the late great Gertrude Himmelfarb mm -hmm. described in much of her work on uh, Victorian uh, Britain. Uh, back in the Victorian era, yeah. I think it was clear to anybody, uh, to any school child, that there was a distinction between poverty, poverty and, misery. and misery. And poverty per se was the uh, shortfall of material resources and misery was a condition of human degradation and mm. um, certain sorts of unhappiness and desperation. That, the Victorians would have uh, equated misery with vice. We don't talk about vice so much yeah. anymore, but we know what we mean when we describe <laughs> that. The, the point, I think, is that it's, it is possible uh, to have uh, adequate resources mm -hmm. and still to find oneself in a miserable condition. Yeah. And understanding that the shortfall of resources is not necessarily mm -hmm. the cause of all misery and degradation mm -hmm. in modern America just seems like something we ought to bear in mind. That's interesting. That's right. Now, another, I think when you were talking about sort of looking at potential reasons why people drop out of the labor force, you, you say that researchers have tried to connect disability receipts with you know men in and out of work you know what's the what's going on there i don't think we have a clear picture some people are saying disability is actually encouraging people to leave the workforce so what's the story there and you know what can we learn from well, qualitative research well, well first of all um we might not need quite as much uh, ethnographic research in this area if our quantitative data, data. were a little exactly. bit better yeah. we have a crazy quilt of government disability benefit programs that don't communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. And this means that we don't have any statistical sources that can give us a comprehensive overview of the profile of disability participation mm -hmm. uh, in the United States today. You can find some information from the Social uh, Security the Administration, yeah. from SSI, SSDI. As anybody but they don't, has worked through. Yeah, they don't talk yeah. to the Veterans That's Administration right. and none of them talk to the state uh, programs or to a workman's comp. Yeah. So there's, there's no comprehensive uh, source of information that mm -hmm. we can look at for our analysis. Mm -hmm. and Alia, I think that's why 
in 19, excuse me, in 2016, yeah. the, uh, the Council of Economic Advisors' admirable report mm -hmm. on uh, declining labor force participation Especially. rates for men made a kind of an error because they said, well, you can't really say there's any connection between this and disability. Uh, they just looked at the Social Security Administration's numbers, which are less than half of the oh, numbers that we, can, yeah. uh, that we can look at just through a, a single uh, uh, SIP survey yeah. by the Census Bureau. So uh, since we are uh, needlessly challenged quantitatively, mm -hmm. it seems to me that it might be beneficial to use ethnographic research mm -hmm. to learn a little bit more yeah. about what about the real life circumstances of people are. Right. Now, with our social science techniques, we will never be able to establish causality mm -hmm. between, we will be able to establish associations but never causality That's right. uh, between the existence of a benefit program and some consequence. Some consequences, yeah. But an observer may be able to give us a little bit more nuance and mm -hmm. sympathy as to what's actually going, going on, on here yeah. and what the family dynamic is. And of course we know that uh, we know that res resources are fungible. Mm -hmm. So a uh, a benefit to another member of the family may also affect the calculations or the behavior of somebody else. That's true. So one one needs to take, I think, a more a more human and holistic mm -hmm. approach to this. And as I say, an empathetic observer may be able Maybe to provide to us that. with a certain amount of. Uh, understanding that we can't get just from the numbers. That's exactly right. And and similarly, I think you you know you talk about people who have a history of, you know, incarceration yes. or who have and and a distinction between people who've been arrested but not incarcerated, yes. you know. And so and that seems to be a big big chunk of the population that is out of the workforce or, you know, even generally ar across the country we're seeing many more cases where people are just dropping out or not getting jobs because of that history. Absolutely. Where does, you know, where does that fit in? Well, it's it's a huge gap in our national social statistical system at the mm -hmm. moment. Um, and the reason for this is just, think of it, it's, it's stock and flow. Right. If you are uh, sentenced, you permanently have a conviction in your background. Yeah. And so it's accumulating over time. And if you look at the stock and flow, there have been some, I think, some fine demographic reconstructions attempting this. We're now at a situation, most likely, where there are more than 20 million American adults not behind bars hmm. who have a felony conviction in their right. background. Yeah. Overwhelmingly guys. Mm -hmm. uh, my back of the envelope uh, calculation suggests that would mean uh, over one in eight adult guys uh, who is in the uh, uh, civilian, uh, non-institutional, non you know, not behind <laughs> yeah. bars population, yeah. more than one in eight would have a felony conviction in their background, probably a higher ratio for prime working age guys. And we have no comprehensive information on their circumstance at all. Mm -hmm. We've got zero on their labor force participation, living arrangements, health situation, mm -hmm. uh, all the things we want to know about human yeah. beings. Uh, so while we wait for uh, the Census Bureau and others to cast some light on this enormous invisible part of America, yeah. we can kind of jumpstart things right. through ethnographic uh, questions, through mm -hmm. seeing if we can understand a little bit better what it's like for people who have right. felony convictions mm -hmm. to try to function after they re-enter society. It's a huge gap and it's, it's, and it's really kind of scandalous. It's an absolutely unnecessary uh, blind spot for America. Mm -hmm. But through the sort of work that you're promoting, mm -hmm. I think we can get to it get an to awful that. lot quicker. 
Right, and and my hope has always been that once we learn from these stories, then we can try to you know put in the right questions exactly. in the household surveys, in the exactly. CPS, in other BLS data sets, so that then you can you know approach the problem more systematically and Absolutely. have more aggregate data. Absolutely, I mean it's yeah. a re it seems to me to be potentially an extremely valuable tool mm -hmm. for asking smarter questions, questions. Exactly. and for getting the sorts of quantitative data better focused, better refined so that we can have the evidence that we want for evidence-based policies. Right? Perfect. I mean, I don't think we, yeah, we see it the same absolutely. way. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Nick. This has been a fascinating conversation, and I encourage everybody to read your chapter in the American Family Diaries. Well, volume. congratulations so on this volume. I think it's a real contribution. Thank you. Hey everyone, that's the end of our discussion with Dr. Nick Eberstadt. Thanks for watching. As always, let us know what other topics you would like AEI scholars to cover on Viewpoint. And to learn more about the American Family Diaries project, check out the links in the description below.